This is Bloomberg Business Week. Insight from the reporters and editors who bring you America's most trusted business magazine. Plus, global business, finance, and tech news. The Bloomberg Business Week podcast with Carol Messer and Tim Stenebeck from Bloomberg Radio. Well, when tomorrow comes, that's when we hear from Fed Chair Jay Powell. 2 p.m., we get the decision. 30 minutes later, we're going to hear from the man himself. It's the sixth meeting of the Federal Reserve's Policy Setting Committee. Uh, policy, policy Setting Committee. We're going to have all the U.S. central banks' latest view on economic projections on the U.S. economy. Is it going to be a snoozer, or might there be some possible fireworks? With his view back with us, we got Dr. Stephen Skanky, Chief Economic Advisor at Keel Point, also a former U.S. Treasury and White House National Security Council staff member, joining us on Zoom from Washington, D.C. Also with us, Anna Wong, Chief U.S. Economist for Bloomberg Economics, on Zoom from our Washington, D.C. Bureau. Uh, Dr. Skanky, good to have you with us. It's a good day to talk to both of you, especially ahead of what, hearing from Fed Chair Jay Powell tomorrow, uh, the committee meeting today, of course. Um, what's top of mind for them, do you think, uh, Dr. Skanky? Well, they're still trying to figure out whether uh, inflation is uh, had just taken a break and is now going to uh, rebound. Uh, certainly, they're concerned about the the high oil and energy price numbers and what that what that's doing in gasoline uh, on the headline and how that translates through to uh, core inflation. So that's that's certainly a c- concern. The other concern is that uh, the economy still seems to be growing pretty robustly. Mm-hmm. Uh, for all the reasons that we think uh, consumer spending should be slowing, the latest numbers uh, last week didn't show that at all. And that's got to be a concern for them. I want to bring in Anna Wong, but first, speaking of, of headlines, the Treasury 10-year yield rising to 4.365%, the highest going all the way back to 2007. Anna Wong is Chief U.S. Economist for Bloomberg Economics. Anna, you've got a great piece out about why a soft landing call always precedes recessions. Uh, take us into the history there and also why you know you think it's a little too early for people to declare a uh, soft landing this time around. Yeah, so you know we have seen four recessions uh, in the past, say uh, since since 1990, and preceding each of those four recessions, uh, there had been a chorus of soft landing optimism. So you you could actually uh, uh, look up the word soft landing across news headline, and it's very clear that that's the trend. And so in that piece, we ask, what is the reason for why soft landing? hopes always peak right before recession. I think I think there are a couple of reasons. Number one is that economists' uh, forecasting tools tend to depend on linear relationships. Unfortunately, unemployment does not follow a linear uh, distribution, uh, uh, gener- data generating process. In fact, during uh, recessions, unemployment tends to jump in a, on a l- non-linear, in a non-linear way. So as a result, when people think linearly, uh, the mean forecast would suggest that unemployment rate would only, you know, slightly rise to 3.9 percent by the end of this year, and that might be uh, the number that the Fed officials, the median participant, to write in, would ri- write in in the update. Data dot, uh, SEP tomorrow, 3.9% unemployment by the end of this year. That is entirely consistent with a linear way of thinking about the world. But if you think about the risk and you we calculated the risk around that mean forecast using historical data, in fact, it shows you that the upside risk for unemployment is actually much, much bigger mm-hmm. than the down, downside risk to unemployment. So this is why we think overall that uh, there's still substantial risk of a recession before the end of the year. Dr. Skanky, weigh in on that. Do you think, do you agree with uh, Anna Wong that there's substantial risk of a U.S. recession by the end of the year? Well, I certainly agree with Anna's uh, research and, and, and analytics on, on this. And, and yes, there is a risk of recession before the end of the year. I happen to think that it's more likely to uh, to bleed into 2024 than necessarily show up here. But there are a lot. I mean, we know that there's a lot of things that are going to be happening in October and November that could uh, could very quickly push consumer spending down 
uh, other things on the on the trade front, business investment. Uh, certainly, uh, Tim, as you mentioned, the high, uh, the record high 10-year Treasury. How does that affect the the psychology of, of business investing? And, and so, several things could all of a sudden start to uh, uh, to spook decision makers, and and we end up with uh, not only a weakening, but even possibly uh, a negative GDP growth. Uh, by the end of the uh, the fourth quarter, the other thing is uh, is money supply uh, has been in a, a negative growth period for now over a year, uh, and historically that correlates very highly with uh, with recession. Uh, that would, uh, if you sort of try to time it out, uh, look more into early uh, 2024 than at the end of 2023. But, uh, but, but even that historically has not been a uh, you know, tightly timed at 18 months. So that's another factor out there that we don't talk about very much, but still a very real factor in, uh, in, in how this thing could turn quickly. So uh, Dr. Wong, uh, tell us how you think uh, the Fed is going to handle, uh, I don't know, talking about the uncertainties that have come up over the last few months here. Uh, the the fact that the tenure has risen so much, the concerns that you raised about unemployment. Um, talk to me about how you think the Fed deals with this with regard to how it's thinking about its interest rate path and, and potentially cutting in 24. Yeah. So, you know, Chairman Powell has already told us very clearly how he deals with uh, uncertainty at the Jackson Hole speech. He said that when there's uncertainty and when there are still um, some of lags of monetary policy operating in the background, he would move slowly. And uncertainty is what we are going to have in the next couple of months. As Steve said, uh, we have, you know, UAW strike ongoing right now. We still have that Hollywood strike. We have a potential government shutdown looming that if it lasts for a month, we expect that it will raise unemployment rate by 0.2 percentage point, and at which point the Psalms rule for uh, kickstarting a recession would be triggered. Um, So I think that um, Powell would definitely perceive all these risks as telling him that uh, they should wait for more information. So uh, I think it's unlikely that the Fed will raise rate in November. However, uh, it might be that he will be holding out the door open for a December oh, hike or even okay. January January hike. A January hike. So much of our conversation over the last few weeks has focused on November, Dr. Skanky. Is, is, what, what's your impression here? Do you think we'll see a... a- well, I agree with what Anna said. Uh, I don't think that the Fed is going to raise rates uh, when they announce tomorrow. Uh, but I do think that uh, Chair Powell will qualify the decision not to raise rates in his remarks uh, by saying something like rates, uh, rate hikes can resume if needed. Uh, mm. uh, I, I think the hold will, will also have some other hawkish elements or, or hawkish connotations in, uh, in the dot plot. Uh, they might even show uh, the possibility of another rate hike. Uh, if not in November, uh, in December, uh, could happen early in January. Uh, so the dot plot uh, and the, the updated uh, summary of economic projections will be important uh, and very interesting. Uh, uh, for example, to see if they ratify the notion that the GDP is, is still growing steadily, albeit maybe a little bit weaker than, than the 2% path that we're on right now. Uh, and, and how do they factor in higher oil prices when they look at uh, uh, PCE inflation. Uh, And what do they say about unemployment? Uh, Yes, uh, again, as Anna said, uh, uh, unemployment does not increase linearly. And uh, uh, they've uh, they've been more hawkish on that. So uh, it'll be very interesting. Uh, What what we see in the dot plot and the the SEP will probably be way more interesting than, than what they say about not raising rates. Oh, interesting. I mean, I'm, I'm looking forward to the SEP, but also, of course, the press conference as well. Dr. Wong, uh, tell us uh, if you have one, if you could ask uh, Jay Powell one question tomorrow, what would it be? 
I would ask him whether he thinks uh, that the strikes is uh, suggesting that maybe inflation expectations are not as anchored as it seemed. I mean, I, we have already seen central bank officials in other countries, such as Reserve Bank of Australia, suggesting that inflation expectations may not be anchored given that union workers are able to demand higher wages. Mm. And we're seeing exactly that happening in the U.S. Wait, how, does oil price, how do oil prices and gas prices factor into inflation expectations, Anna? Well, that, that's the th it, it's, it's like a chicken and egg uh, problem. From the Fed's perspective, if they believe that inflation expectations are anchored, yeah. they will look through the increase in oil prices. But if they don't believe that it's very anchored, they won't look through it. So I think the inflation expectations uh, question is really the core of what they will do. Dr. Skanky, 10 seconds, one question that you would ask Jay Powell tomorrow. What's the trigger point for deciding that uh, rates need to be increased again, either in November or December? All right, there it is. Really appreciate both of you joining us this afternoon, the eve before we hear from Fed Chair Jay Powell tomorrow. That's Dr. Stephen Skanky, Chief Economic Advisor at Keel Point, former U.S. Treasury and White House National Security, Security St uh, Council staff member. Also, Dr. Anna Wong, Chief U.S. Economist for Bloomberg Economics. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern. Listen on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, and the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. This next voice is going to sound familiar because we caught up with him at the Milken Institute Global Conference earlier this year. So great to have back with us in studio. Hans Kobler, he's founder and managing partner of Energy Impact Partners. They have about $3 billion in assets under management. They invest in clean energy technologies and they help deploy them through partnerships with companies trying to decarbonize. He is in town for Climate Week and as I said, he's here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. Nice to have you here with Tim and myself. Great being here. Welcome back. Come on closer to the mic because we want to make sure yeah. we can hear you. Um, the energy transition. Let's start basic. How's it going? It's going well. It's picking up momentum. We had yeah. the first year in history that more money was spent on the energy transition than on traditional energy, 1.1 trillion. So the momentum is building. A tipping point? Uh, it's a tipping point. It's, but it's the beginning. It's the first inning of a long, long race. Uh, you know, if you believe McKinsey and some forecasts, we will need eight, nine trillion dollars a year. 150 trillion. That's 15 internets or one and a half times the global economy spend over the next few decades. <laughs> that's so, a lot. Uh, that's a lot. And we may, you know, we may not get there, but we are taking it serious. So it's picking up momentum. Well, one thing that I think about when it comes to the energy transition is the role of nuclear power. And here in the U.S., it's a really checkered history. It's a really checkered past. It's very expensive for us to build nuclear power plants. There are always cost overruns. And then you have the legacy of Fukushima, Three Mile Island, and Chernobyl. What are your thoughts on nuclear? I think uh, so. We have in we have a lot of corporate partners in our investor group. The Southern Company was the last one here to try to build a nuclear plant. They finally got them all online, which is great. Uh, we have uh, EDF as an investor that had 55 in the country running, and half of them didn't work when they when they shut down the Russian gas. And Tepco was an investor too. So nuclear, you, you know, the clean energy transition is amazing and a lot will be wind and solar but you need the base load and mm -hmm. nuclear is still the best way to get to the base load so i think it's critical to to keep that in the arsenal i'm from germany originally i mean you can tell tell the accent you know the probably the greenest country that has most ambitions to go clean they spend a ton on but they're even wind and solar down nuclear. and they shut down the, which is a stupid thing to do it's uh, i mean is this reversible yeah, but it's hard. It's you hard. Saw them it's hard. It Once you California. shut down an industry, you you have to build up the the talent to build new to new, build new nuclear plants. You can. But I guess my question is: can, can we transition to net zero without nuclear? Right. Hard. How crucial is it? Hard. The the transition to net zero is not only converting what we have today, but to deal with the demand that we are facing. We have had a flat demand curve in this country for twenty years. We are now electrifying transportation. We are building data centers running on AI where one Google search, uh, where one AI search is taking about 50 to 100 times more power than a Google search. So, so you're talking about doubling 
the infrastructure that we built over a hundred years, if Elon Musk is out there saying, no, 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 whatever you are calculate, it's going to be tripled. So you need a lot of electrons. And so there is not one solution for that. That means we have to, you know, use different tools in the toolkit to get there and get there a lot faster than we have been. Um, but Hans, can, you, can we do it, this energy transformation without nuclear? Uh, yes, but I think it would be a lot cheaper if we did it with nuclear. And at the end of the day, you know, we have to address something that we call in the industry trilemma. Everyone wants to go clean, but when you but but when you face not having power at all, security reliability gets on the on the horizon. And when the Germans pay twelve times more for natural gas than the Americans, and four times more for electricity, then affordability comes in, right? So that's mm -hmm. an equation. But this trilemma is an equation very difficult to solve. But also solve. motivation, perhaps, to invest uh, in renewable sources uh, that, in the long run, are less expensive. Absolutely. But in, in a way, in our view, the only way to solve that equation of this trilemma is to really to apply innovation. That means you need new technologies, great technologies, and you need to uh, collaborate. You need to involve the incumbents, the existing infrastructure sits on, sit on trillions of dollars of investments that we have to help them get there faster. That's, by the way, is the business model that we have, where we team up with corporates and bring them together in a room with the innovators and the capital to forge those alliances to accelerate that transition. It's, it, 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 look, everybody wants to you know, see the rosy sky, but you've got to be pragmatic about it. And that means, that means we've got to work together and work faster and harder than we have in the past. So when you have those conversations and those collaborations, what is it that you speak most about? Tim brought up nuclear, right? And it, we feel like it was become such a no-no. Is it is it nuclear? Is it hydro? Is it solar? Is it EV? Like, what is it that peop that you guys spend a lot of time talking about with yes. your partners? Yeah, <laughs> yes. Check, yes. check, check, check. Yeah, yeah, yes, so it, it is a complex undertaking. We need to decarbonize supply. We need to create a lot more supply. So that's one focus area. The second one is um, we need to create sustainable demand. That means electrifying a lot of the industries from uh, transportation to home heating to the data centers, indoor agriculture. Mm -hmm. And then you have to deal with the high intermittency you create. So I was just t telling you it's two to three times more power that we need, but at its peak, it could be five times as much. You know, it's like building a church for Easter Sunday. And we got to somehow we have to balance that. And that means you have to invest in transmission distribution, which is very difficult, right? It took 15 years to get the clean electrons from Canada through two of the greenest states to New York because nobody wants to build anything in their backyard. Right. Um, you build storage and great technologies are coming up. You invest in form, you invest in power. And so, but that is a lot of space uh, that is needed and takes some time. Or you digitize the communication between the customer and the supplier, and you tell them, look, don't charge your car at six o'clock, do it at midnight. Right. You know, it turned down, you know, it's nice I and cool in here, and it's nice hours. and cool in here, just <laughs> don't cool right now because everybody's cooling. Can I, can I ask you, we've only about 30 seconds left here, would you invest in a fossil fuel energy company, an oil and gas company? No. You wouldn't anymore? No, we, even we, though well, there's going to be demand yeah, some, for some, years, some, some people, you know, look, we, we need uh, certainly natural gas for. And a long, I know you're long kind of time. talking your book because that's. Not we, we, we need natural <laughs> gas for a long, long time. Okay. Um, but we personally would not invest. There. We we are fund focused on, you know, we are an Article Nine fund. We, uh, we we invest in things that decarbonize the global economy. But if you weren't, would you? If I was a financial investor, I would. Okay. All right. Love having you come here. Always provocative. I always learn something. Come back soon. Yeah, will do. Hans Kobler. He's founding. Dwayne Itoko, founder and managing partner, Energy Impact Partners here in our studio. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business app, and YouTube. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Climate Week in New York, uh, against the backdrop of the 78th session of the UN General Assembly, you know that we've been talking about it. They have, the UN, has identified 17 specific SDG sustainable development goals, including building out resilient technology infrastructure. And to get there and reach some of those 17 SDGs, the UN has highlighted high impact initiatives, among them unlocking the data dividend, which our next guest participated in an event that happened uh, here this week. With us is Johannes Uting. Am I saying it right? 
Perfect. Okay. He's being kind. Uh, but he's executive head of the Partnership in Statistics for Development in the 21st Century. The acronym is Paris 21, which is hosted by the OECD in, in Paris. I, mu I have to say, though, Johannes, former member of the UN Secretary General's expert group on the data revolution. He's a development economist, expertise in employment, social protection, healthcare, financing, and gender. He's looked at the world in a lot of different ways, and we are delighted to have him here in our uh, Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. Welcome, welcome. Thank you very much for inviting me. Well, thank you. And I've learned about Paris 21 because my daughter has done an internship uh, with you all this summer, so full transparency. But I've learned a lot. Tell us, though, in your words, your mission and your goals, what you guys are all about. Paris 21 stands for Partnership in Statistics in Development for the 21st Century. Uh, we basically do three things. We help countries uh, with technical capacity development, national statistical offices. So we help um, training of uh, managers in statistical offices in poor countries like Rwanda and others. So we uh, organize trainings. We help with coordination in many parts of um, when you produce data. There are many uh, ministries involved. There are development agencies involved and we help them with to get coordinated. And last but not least, we do advocacy. And you just mentioned uh, the UNGA week, uh, the SDG summit. And we do advocacy for more and better funding for data and statistics. Well, what's interesting, in a world that's so overrun with data, we just assume it's good. Ev no, we don't assume it's good. We talk about biased data and uh, kind of dirty data, not great data. But not all data is good. Not all data is productive or useful, right? And so you guys are involved in that, in helping countries develop infrastructure so that they can actually accumulate their own data sets, correct? To Absolutely correct. Yeah. I think what is a bit uh, difficult sometimes to understand is on the one hand, we have a data tsunami. We have all these data, digital data, uh, which, is, which is very good, which is feeding artificial intelligence and innovation. On the other for hand, we worse. have, um, <laughs> and on the other hand, we have uh, data gaps terrible data gaps. In, in some countries, we don't even know of how many people in a country are living. We have difficulties to um, measure birth rates and to register those people. We have a lot of data gaps in the SDGs, We in, in particular on climate change or gender equality. We are literally flying blind. Mm -hmm. So we are supporting as Paris 21 with our partners um, to close those data gaps, to, to be able to do better decisions, but also to hold our governments accountable. I think that's also a very important aspect of this. So that if you say you want to reduce poverty in a given country by X percent, you want to have the start point and the end point, and you want to see if this is on track. We've talked a lot this year about AI mm -hmm. and the impact that AI is having on companies whose stocks are publicly traded. What about when it comes to your work and how you can use AI to make sense of this data and help these poorer countries actually make positive change? Are you using it? An excellent question. I mean, what, what we see is that there are two, I mean, we often talk about silos, right? I mean, and this is a real silo. We are, on the one hand, we have people talking about the data that you were just mentioning, feeding into the uh, algorithms and that supporting these AI-driven innovation. And on the other hand, we have data for development, which is an own space by itself, and there is not enough crossover. If you look at the G20 statement at the last one, there is a working group on data for development, and there is a working group on digital data. So there is yet not enough overlap. I think it's it's about to close and um, artificial intelligence for the public good is of course very important. Mm -hmm. But also the quality of the data that you feed into it is is is, is essential. Garbage, garbage in, garbage, garbage out. out. Exactly. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so the quality of the data to help countries produce um, verified quality statistics even is, is, is very central and often, unfortunately, um, not in the spotlight. Well, you can't have transformative, I'm stealing words from you guys, but transformative policy without transformative data, correct? Absolutely correct, yeah. And well, and I'm curious about, you know, in a world where there's lots of stress points, I'm thinking, you know, the hottest world, right, hottest temperatures on record, so there's a lot going, you know, a lot of focus on climate, but investment in infrastructure systems so that the data collection is better, how tough is that to get the money going where it needs to go? That's uh, unfortunately, it's a very, very difficult exercise. So we currently spend around six, seven hundred million on data and statistics from official uh, development aid, ODA aid. 
and this is less than a percentage point since years. So we would need mm -hmm. to ramp up significantly the international support for data and statistics, but we also need to convince countries to invest uh, part of their taxpayers' money, domestic resources, into it. And the payoff, I mean, the thing is, if I invest into a hospital, if you are a minister, what would you do? Would you invest in a hospital or in vaccination or education? Or would you invest in a national statistical office? Right. You would probably I mean, the first, yeah. right? because then you That's can show right. after two, three years it's done. These benefits for ne investment in national statistical systems will only take time. Uh, the benefit will take time 10, 15 years later. They feed into everything well, else. Sell us on it. You know, if you're trying to sell a minister on making this investment, how do right. you do it? What's the cost by not making those investments? The, what we say is if you want to have, I mean, for instance, economic growth. I mean, it's very critical to have a very good understanding about key economic indicators, right? And if those are not... Um, uh, sort of measured in your country, you will not be able, to, first of all, to make very good decisions. You will not uh, invest your public resources very efficiently. You are not even able to tell you if you do it or not. So um, in that sense, we are not asking for a lot of money. It's, it's peanuts. It's literally peanuts. And uh, there are a lot of, uh, we have a lot of good tools at hand to help. Um, so I think uh, for, for a minister, and many planning ministers actually know this, and, and they are behind this. Uh, it's sometimes just the politics behind, which is a bit difficult. No, politics, no. But what's interesting is I <laughs> Not think here it, in the U.S. I think about the amount of investment decisions that are made up of like all of the U.S. economic statistics or global statistics right in the developed world. Um, we've got about a minute and a half left. Johannes, you know... Um, or we've got maybe, a lot of time. Oh, we've a little bit more. Worry. Sorry. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. You know, it's been that kind of crazy day. So I think about like our audience who's listening, a smart financial investment audience. What is it that they need to understand about, again, the importance of it and, and potentially the payoff or what's being missed by not accurately having data on a lot of different countries? I think we have to talk about the opportunities and the investment opportunities. We will have next year in Medellin a World Data Forum. Yeah. So all your listeners, uh, your community uh, is uh, quarterly invited because we, we are working more and more with, this, with the private sector, of course, with the big companies that have a lot of data. They make those data also because we were asking about AI. I will later today attend uh, by Google an AI for public good. There are many other companies who, who are actively engaging. I think they could do a little bit more, though, and also sees it as a public good. So I think for the um, many of our uh, colleagues and partners from the private sector are interested. So so are civil society organizations, by the way. And to bring them together in multi-partnership, that's the partnership part, uh, um, is, 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 is very important. How can we make the data collection easier from the perspective of these countries? And I'm, I'm thinking about public-private partnerships specifically. I mean, think about the data that you know a mobile phone company has about uh, what somebody does on their phone, transactions that they make. I mean, you can, you can get really granular information that can tell stories about an economy. Um, what's the role of a private company in, in, in working with a government to provide that data? Because there are some privacy concerns, too. It, it's on point, exactly how you say. On the one hand, I mean, this, we call this public-private partnership. And there are some really very nice public-private partnership out, out there where telephone companies share confidentially uh, and secure the data. But of course, it's a business risk as well. I mean, and you have to see of what, what, is, mm -hmm. what has happened to this data and so on and so forth. Um, but there are some, some very good promising examples of how what we call big data, specifically on geospatial data, is used, for instance, on poverty mapping, uh, day and night uh, um, uh, uh, satellite imagery. So you can look at, uh, at a given uh, country and you can compare uh, the light uh, nights and you can compare it with a day and then you can make a sort of calculation do these people have light electricity or not and from this with other data you can estimate how poor people are and you also know for your investors where maybe you can put some infrastructure to, to solve this problem. You know, and that's what I was thinking about. It was interesting. I was over at um, the Earthshot Prize uh, Bloomberg Philanthropies event, and we talked with some of the finalists of the Earthshot Prize, and they've come up with different ways to decarbonize the world. And one of the things, let's talk about what you're doing, but then it's like, what's the impact? Talk to us about some of either the data sets that you have helped accumulate and what it has led to. If you can give us some examples. Of course. I mean, we have been, we do uh, a lot of country work. And in specifically, one area which is very important is on gender. Mm -hmm. So in, in some parts of this world, I mean, through our support in the Maldives, in um, Colombia, in, in, in Africa, in many countries, we have now more sex disaggregated data, which is fantastic 
for, for many different purposes. I mean, this it sounds will help. so basic, right? But yeah, it's absolutely. Amazing. I mean, to, to sort of to, to know of how many men and women there are, children. So um, we, we, we have a, quite a couple of countries where we can show success, where we can show impact. And this impact is uh, leading governments also to invest more in, in, into data and statistics. So um, you can say the glass is maybe more half full than half empty in our area. Yeah. But through these events like what we have here at the highest level, that we had the DSG, Amina Mohamed was opening the high impact initiative. We had another event, just a breakfast on 7 a.m. in the morning, full room, very, very important people. So there is more consideration for, for the topic. And um, I'm, I'm rather optimistic then for the next eight years that we can give it a big push and uh, we will be able to convince more people that this is an important part of the development nexus. Johannes, you talked about Google and like the, or the meeting you're going to, that you've had or the conversations you've had. And I do wonder about how much increasingly the private sector can play in all of this. It's interesting. We had a guest yesterday and we were talked about um, the roaring 20s yeah. and the crash and FDR and we talked about who were the power brokers back then and it was, you know, the Carnegies and, you know, those kind of folks who were industrialists. Today's power brokers are the data CEOs and the data companies. What you are trying to do, does it increasingly have to come from the private sector or does that not necessarily give you the purest data that you want. <laughs> I'm trying Ab to think for yeah, the right it's a, it's, a, it's a very, very important question. Because they have so much. Uh, they have so much data, but of course data is also linked to power. Yeah. And it's, it has lots of questions about confidentiality. It's about the use, the safe use of the data. And of course, these companies want to make business. What we are talking here is about a public good. So if you talk specifically about a specific subcategory, like official statistics, I would say this should stay in the hand of governments. There are certain criteria. We have principles for how to produce those things. It's a public good. We don't know what happens to that data, but I think some of these data is just essential for the government, for private sector, for civil society as well, right. to see where a country stands. Uh, how is uh, about the education system? So to leave this to the private sector, uh, I don't think is a good mm -hmm. idea. To have the private sector feed into those official statistics, that's a very different question. But we need to be on the same level playing field. And we just talked about the numbers. If you look at the budget of an official statistical office in a poor country and you compare it with any other private sector funding, it's very clear where the power relate, how the power relationship is. Will investor money not flow in if you don't have those data sets? Well, to I'm some extent, about the relationship. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, 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 it's flowing in. But then we make uh, in, in, in some countries where we um, this birth registration that I mentioned, yeah. death registration, uh, this is terrible mistakes are possible. And, and also uh, sort of investments that are not uh, sort of leading to the uh, estimated uh, results. I mean, the middle class, for instance, you, you want to know as, a, as, a, as an investor, the middle class in India, is it is it 500 million? And how, how big is it actually? Do you always trust the data? No, no, not at all. <laughs> I mean, there, there is. Was I mean, there were. Uh, no, it's I mean, a, no, I mean, but there is. Yeah. Also without calling out individual countries specifically, yeah. or feel free no. to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there, there are. We, I mean, we can. Even, we can talk about the past. The, even the developed markets, right? We question some yeah. of the U.S. statistics. There, I but mean, anyway. there are two examples that uh, very well known. It's Greece uh, and also Argentina at, at some point in the past, and uh, there was about the inflation CPI, um, which is a very well documented. So um, the, the good thing is that there is a trusted community that would call out those uh, misbehavior. Um, there's also a misunderstanding sometimes there is not one truth in the data. That is not, it's, it's not truth. It's what's important is you make it very clear that you abide to statistical standards and that the data is sort of produced with a certain quality standards and you make it very open. And then you can start this debate about it which is really more fascinating than you, you sometimes tend to believe. I know from my daughter that, because she's done work with you guys in, on gender. Why gender versus healthcare versus employment versus financing? Or how do you choose where you want to focus on? How does that, or is that determined by the money that comes in and somebody's interest? Or how, how do you figure? Because there's so many probably different ways you could go. Absolutely. I mean, the, the demand is immense. Yeah. Um, I think many of the questions around gender are underpinning every other sector. If you, if you look at development, we look often at sectors. We look at agriculture, we look at health, we look at education, right. and we try to improve all those sectors. And the SDGs have 17 different quote-unquote 
sectors. Gender is underpinning everything. I mean, in, in, in terms of if we invest in good investment in, in gender statistics, which could be, I mean, sex disaggregated data, but also uh, access to uh, gender-based violence, or which is important to, to, to document as well. So it's underpinning all other sectors. And what you also probably have talked about quite a lot in the show is, is, is about the economic benefit to use the potential of women's empowerment, in particular, for instance, to access to ownership rights of, of resources, land, credit, insurance. Right. So once you unlock this potential, once you have an opportunity and you, you know how many women have access to land and what kind of land and credit and education, this will help you to make targeted investment and which helps for all other sectors. So it's, it's a huge Good multiplier story. effect next to um, that's an intrinsic value that women and men should be treated equally. Okay, what about when it comes to data collection and how different countries are, are collecting data? Are you seeing, a, you know, in terms of developing countries where they don't necessarily have the infrastructure built in, are you seeing them invest in technologies that are so-called leapfrogging technologies that allow them to sort of bypass the big infrastructure investments that were made in the past? And I'm thinking like, you know, ways to provide internet to folks without wireline broadband, you know, without actually digging holes, using satellites, uh, being able to use data collection instead of launching satellites, use drones, for example. This is happening, and I'm personally, I collected myself, I'm, when I did my master's thesis, I went to um, a couple of countries and collected data for my, for my own thesis, so I was working with national statistical offices, and we had these paper forms. So you went with a paper form with a, with a questionnaire and you asked all these questions and then you went back and then you had to type it in. I have seen statistical office packed with lots of paper and, and, and you can simple. imagine, Sounds I mean, so it yeah. looks like in your office more or less. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so, um, hey, 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 so, so, so this is changing now using um, mobile phones yeah. and uh, copies and, and, and different forms of, of uh, basically collecting the data electronically. And this is happening even in poor countries. So there yeah. are... Techno you, you said it very nicely. You said this leapfrogging is happening. I mean, we are not seeing, we also work at the OECD with, of mm. course, uh, rich uh, country statistical offices. And you can really see the difference of how national statistical office, in particular in these middle income categories like Philippines, eventually Ghana, uh, Colombia, how they jump over this and how they change the, the infrastructure and through very different forms of using modern technologies. And this is really how very, very nice to see. Well, I, I know in our prep call I said you kind of open up a window to something that we are not necessarily aware of, and we just take for granted that there's so much data everywhere. So this was really enlightening. Thank you so much. Thank safe, you so much. Safe travels. Pleasure to be here. So enjoyed it. Johannes Juting, he's executive head of the Partnership in Statistics for Development in the 21st Century, a.k.a. Paris 21. This is Bloomberg. I'm driving in my car, I turn on the radio. How about you let me drive? Oh, no, 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 no. Who's gonna drive you home? Honey, please, I'll do the driving. Drive on. Excuse me, I want to drive. You drive crazy. It's the question that drives us. You drive me crazy. This is the drive to the close. It's that funky music will drive us till the dawn. On Bloomberg Radio. All right, everybody. Carol Master along with Wait, Jim Stenevec. Who is that? Yeah, I just kind of Who is that? Uh, we're going to talk about more of what I was doing later on. We were at the Earthshot Prize and the Bloomberg uh, Innovation Summit uh, here at the Plaza in New York City. But it's all about innovators who are doing very cool things. A lot of it is about how can we improve the climate. I'm sorry I missed and it. And reduce the carbon footprint. I'm sorry I missed it. I'm glad you're Prince back. Prince William was a little ticked off. Uh, you did, did you tell him I said hi? <laughs> I will, I okay. will. Uh, but I was holding down the fort, don't worry. He did talk about, though, this Treasury 10-year yield rising to 4.365% highest since 2007. He did not. But uh, nonetheless, <laughs> we're talking we about. are talking about it. We want to see what Charles Tan has to say, because this is definitely in his wheelhouse. He's co-CIO of Global Fixed Income at American Century Investments. He's here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, and he's been watching how the sausage is made. <laughs> um, thank you, thank you. Welcome, welcome. Thank uh, you. 10-year. Uh, five year, we've seen the highest yield since 07. Right. Significant? Uh, absolutely, yeah. So, you know, over the past uh, couple of years, I think some of the major changes in a global economy and also global uh, financial markets are leading to this uh, higher inflation and not surprisingly higher rates environment. And, uh, you know, we think, uh, having said that, we feel like, uh, you know, tomorrow is, is a Fed meeting, right? right. So um, that could well be the end of this, uh, you know, hiking cycle. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, we are expecting what's so called about like a hawkish, you know, pause tomorrow, meaning that you know there were pause, but they will. You read the Bloomberg story that said hawkish pause. Did you ah, know? okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah that is, has kidding. been that's actually been sort of the market consensus know, for, for a while. So, and we're um, definitely going along with, with the, you know the the market consensus in the, on this one. Um, but you're not going to pause, and they're going to sound hawkish. Um, so there still might be a chance of a hike in November, uh, but we believe by the time when uh, November comes around, uh, the economic data will be weak enough for them to say, this is it. Okay, I'm gonna just throw this out there. I'm gonna get a little crazy, okay? Mm -hmm. I was walking in the office yesterday and we're to that point in the economic cycle where a colleague of mine who, you know, doesn't, you know, he's, he's, he stops me, knows what I do for work and he's like, I wanna talk to you about bonds. Mm. And he's like, he's close to retirement, he's like, why would I not buy two year bonds that yield over 5% right now? He's like, I've ignored bonds for years. Right. Why would I not do that right now? And I said, first of all, I can't provide investment advice, friend. <laughs> I have no idea, but I'll ask, I'll ask Charles all about it. Well, I would say, you know, your colleague is, is definitely on the right path, you know, cause you know, this is a very, uh, it's the very first time in uh, multiple years, actually investors and savers, if you're retirement, they're thinking about savings are uh, actually getting a really, you know, attractive yield, right? Mm -hmm. So you talk about a 5%, you can put your money in the money market, don't worry about it, or you can put your money in the buying treasury bills, 5%, that's it, you feel pretty good about it. If you're willing to take a little bit more risk, uh, let's say, you know, we actually recently launched a new product called uh, FUSI, it's an ETF, a floating rate, uh, you know, instrument. A little bit more risk, double A rated, you know, in, in the bond world, you know, Highest is triple A, mm -hmm. double A, single A, then you know high yield mm -hmm. kind of thing. So, double A average is very high quality. So, is this corporate? This is a corporate structured and also floating rate mortgage bond. Okay. All together, floating rates. You don't take any risk. You right. Know, on a floating rate interest rates, you take a little bit credit risk. You get a seven percent. Then, if you're a bit more adventurous, you can go into high yield bank loans. You can get eight to ten percent. Right. So this is a far cry from a, a merely like a year and a half, two years mm -hmm. ago, right? If you compare bonds today versus the uh, stocks, uh, it's also the polar opposite. Two years ago, uh, I think uh, you know bond yield, as we know, was almost zero, and uh, you know uh, stock dividend uh, yield was about like two percent, and earnings yield about five percent. Today, bond yield is about five to six percent, seven percent. You can take a bit more risk. Uh, but where is uh, dividend yield? 1.5%. And where is uh, earnings yield? It's only 4%. Right. So that's why you're seeing a lot of you know, flows into money market funds, into you know, short duration funds. And I think your friend is really having his uh, mind in the right place. But that's interesting. Talk to us about yeah. where the investment money is going. Is it all short duration at this point? I think so far, uh, you know, the flow, the vast majority of flow are going into the short end money market funds in particular, which is at a historical Which is really high, short, yeah. Right? Um, but we also believe there are opportunities now uh, with the Fed, you know, almost at the end of the hiking cycle. The 10 year, you just mentioned about a 4.36%. Yeah. We think it looks attractive. Um, the mm -hmm. reason we think it's attractive is because, you know, um, when you have a recession, when you have economic slowdown, when inflation comes down, interest rates tend to decline, right? When that declines, and then you can, you know, add, you know, sort of more duration to your portfolio by buying not only front end, but also, you know, five-year bond, seven-year bond, 10-year bond. But investors and aren't doing that yet. Not a yet. Because Is it because they don't know if the hiking cycle's done? I think or if there's more room to run on yields? I think there is anxiety about, you know, the sort of when the hiking cycle will be down and what that means for- I think that's an understatement. Yes. <laughs> I, I think you're absolutely right. Well, I, I, honestly, I think the whole- Anxiety in all yeah. caps, exclamation yeah, point, right. exclamation point. The, the whole world is debating on, you know, uh, they say, is inflation really turning or is going to be actually reviving at a certain point? But to that point, fundamentally, it's interesting coming from the Earthshot Innovation Summit that we do here at Bloomberg, you know, it's all about reducing the carbon footprint. But we are in this interesting cycle where we, it feels like more companies are getting more aggressive about their ESG aspects mm -hmm. and reducing their carbon footprint. I mean, right. hottest year on record already here yes. yep. globally. So I do wonder if those shifts, some of those things that are out there, does it mean that the inflation picture is higher mm. than it's been? And do I, we need to accept that? Yeah, I, I think you Even if the Fed will not. That's right. So I think that this inflation sort of a trend is a very complicated question, you know, as it should be. 
the way we look at it is this. You know, we think inflation in the near term, call it one to two years, is going to be going down. But then over a three to five year time horizon, you may well come back. So this is what we call you know, cyclically you know, a down, but secular up. Why we think that's the case? Yeah. Near term, one to two, to two years, you know, in that time horizon, we believe there are going to be a hard landing. There will be a recession. And in the recession, you know, demand will go down and the supply will naturally go up. And, uh, you know, the trend of inflation naturally will go, you know, go down in that time horizon. Uh, another factor really is money supply. You know, mm -hmm. I'm sure you know over the past uh, two or three years, there's a huge uh, supply in money supply, right? right. So now uh, money supply. And We're going to talk about with the New York State Comptroller. Uh, Thomas DiNapoli, like in the last three years, it's been great for state cities, That's right. right? They've yep. been able to cut taxes because there's yep. been so much money coming in. Very right. different environment. Today. Exactly. So, you know, um, you know, M2 right now is contracting, which is supporting sort of the inflation will be down uh, at least for the next couple of years. But then longer term, we believe there are many structural sort of changes in the global economy, including ESG, you right. know, energies, uh, you know, a lack Social of energy, government. sort of yeah. the investment. But there are other forces at work as well that will push uh, inflation up secular. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, great to get some time with you. Thank you. And thank you for dealing with our craziness <laughs> before we went We're on air. Nuts. Get a little idea of behind the scenes. Charles Tan, he's co-CIO of Global Fixed Income over at American Century Investments here in studio. This is the Bloomberg Business Week podcast, available on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, TuneIn, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal.